So let's get started. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, great process discovery session. Um, we have three awesome papers um, that will talk about one of the core tasks in process mining, uh, process discovery. Um, and it is my pleasure to introduce Zander Lehmans, who will be our first uh, speaker. Zander, uh, can you share screens, please? Um, each speaker will have 15 minutes and five minutes, and then we'll have a five minute uh, Q&A session. Um, Zander, the floor is yours. Thanks, Arik. Um, and um, I would like to uh, today present work uh, we did with uh, Kanika and Bas, and uh, with also with help from uh, Mo Win and Dirk Valand. Um, and before I tell you what um, exactly I mean with multi-level mining, um, I have to set the scene and talk about what is process mining. Um, we assume that there is an unknown process and that this process executes and records its cases in an event log. Process discovery, the theme of this session, um, then discovers a process model that describes the event log and indirectly also the process. Process discovery techniques have to um, face trade-offs and therefore a process model, once it is discovered, needs to be checked against an event log uh, for its quality using a conformance checking technique. Finally, once this uh, is established, we can uh, enhance the process model and get all kinds of nice insights out of them in order to improve the process. Now let's look at an, uh, at an example of an event log. Um, this is a very small um, example. And um, we see, uh, as usual, every row is an event and every column is an attribute. Now, typically, if we look at control flow for process discovery, then one column is used. So, and very often that is the concept name column. Um, however, this has a few downsides. First of all, there are false repetitions if we just consider this concept name column in this example. So for instance, the first three events are all handle leads, but however, um, these all denote the execution of one activity only. And we can see that in the lifecycle transition column that goes from schedule via start to complete. So this is a false repetition and process discovery techniques have to handle that. Then there is um, lost structure. So in this particular example, um, we have another column, the second column called sub process. And this would, um, this is an example from the BPI challenge 2017 logs. There are three of these sub processes and they interact with one another, but they are still kind of different. So by not taking that column into account, we lose a little bit of structure that um, techniques can use. And in the end, these two um, factors together uh, lead to more complex models than is actually necessary. So what I'm uh, proposing uh, today is to use multiple columns in um, control flow discovery and conformance checking. And we, we refer to that as multi-level process mining. Um, so a bit more detail about this multi-level um, concept. So we are talking about event attributes such as concept name and organizational group. And very often, some of these denote activities, but in a certain hierarchy. For instance, we already saw concept name and lifecycle transition, but there are more elaborate um, hierarchies available in literature, such as for BPI Challenge 2018, subprocess, concept name, and lifecycle transition. These three together denote the activities that are being performed. Now, the, um, what we assume is that the user has selected a so-called multi-level classifier. So the user has told us the, the columns and the order in which the columns denote the activities. And what I would like to stress is that this hierarchy is there in the data. It's not something that we make up. Um, it's there in the data and we're going to use it. The user only has to tell us where to find it. In future work, um, we um, intend to do this automatically by uh, means of recommendation. So let's get back to our example event log and transform this into a so-called multi-level language. So we have our event log and we have our multi-level classifier. Oh, too many scrolls. Um, and then the 
the multi-level language that belongs to this event lock is shown at the bottom. So it's uh, still the same uh, traces. However, each event is now a vector of three um, uh, elements. And together, these three denote uh, the execution of an activity. So this is our, um, let's say, our concept. Rather than a normal language, we have a multi-level language. Um, so um, if we want to do multi-level process mining, the first thing we need is a multi-level process model. So given that we have a multi-level uh, classifier, now let's look at what uh, uh, we can uh, do with process models that are multi-level. Um, multi-level models are hierarchical models where each of uh, the levels in this multi-level model denotes a ordinary process model in any formalism you can think of. Um, I'm talking about transitions here, and with the transition, I mean anything that denotes the execution of a step of the process. So in a Petri net, it would be a transition. In a declare mode, it would be the activity. Uh, in a process tree, an activity leaf, and so on. So each of these transitions in any kind of formalism can be silent. It can be an activity, or it can be an activity annotated with a submodel. Let me give you an example. This is a multi-level model where the top level consists of A, B in a declarative language. On the bottom left, um, as an annotation of the activity A is a um, workflow net. And on the right, as an annotation of activity B is a directly follows model. So these together form a multi-level model. And we can mix formalisms as we want. And we're gonna we're gonna see actually how to do that. Um, the language of this uh, multi-level model is shown here. So again, each uh, event is an, is a vector of multiple um, elements, and they correspond to executions of uh, levels of models on particular levels in the multi-level models. Um, so that's the the type of models that we would like to to consider in multi-level. Uh, process mining. Let's now look at how we can discover such miners, such models. Um, and I've dubbed this the multi-level miner. And now let me walk through it uh, by means of an example. So as a first step, um, when we are uh, considering a particular level in, uh, in our multi-level language, as the input, um, for instance, this one, we consider the top layer and we remove all um, repetitions of the same activity that, that comes straight after. So here we would, we would remove the second A event and end up with this language. We don't care about any lower level at this moment. Next, we apply any discovery technique that you can think of. And um, that discovery technique, we assume, only takes the top level into account. So let's say that we now find this directly follows model where A uh, is followed by B. Um, on the left, I, I'm keeping track of uh, the, the hierarchy that we found. Next, um, now we have a model and we have our original um, log. And using alignments, um, we can match them to each other uh, to, um, uh, to find out where the execution of each transition started and ended. So we, we changed the model a little bit to allow for these kind of repetition. And then um, the alignments will tell us um, which event belongs to which activity and which part of the subtrace belongs to that. So if we do that for our uh, example, then uh, for the transition B, we get the, the top um, multi-level sublock. And for A, we get the multi-level sublock on the bottom. Now we have two smaller logs, and we can recurse. However, we, we go one level deeper. So for um, uh, the, the, the activity A and the sublock for A, we um, derive the following model that X is directly followed by Y. Similarly, for um, the transition B and the sublock we derived for B, we can find a different uh, model shown here. Notice again that. Um, any mix of formalisms can be used and they are not dependent on one another. Well, the only thing is that we need to be able to um, align them. Um, 
that's the a discovery technique for uh, the multi-level uh, models. Now, what, what do we need next? We need a conformance checking technique. Um, and conformance checking for now, um, we um, flatten this model to a regular workflow net and then align it using or um, apply any conformance checking technique that you that you want. Um, and this will this can give us um, the the, uh, the quality measures that we need for our evaluation. Notice that it, this only works for now uh, for models that have a representation in workflow nets and that includes directly follows models, petri nets, and process trees, um, and probably many more. However, declarative language at the moment is not supported by this technique. Now. To evaluate our um, new miner, um, we uh, took six real life logs that I showed you already in the beginning, and we manually chose multi level classifiers. Um, we measured fitness and precision because we have, uh, in our conformance checking technique, we have a flattened uh, battery net, so we can, we can do that, and that is comparable. However, for simplicity, which is, of course, the main driver to um, go for uh, multi-level models, um, we had to do something else because a normal simplicity wouldn't really capture what we want to achieve because we, we split up the model into, into smaller parts. Um, however, if we then combine them all together and um, cons consider them as one flat model, then, of course, we, we didn't measure what we actually wanted to achieve. So... Um, what we did was uh, we looked in literature and found that um, there is a significant negative correlation of uh, the number of nodes in a graph and the edges and average connection degree in the uh, in a graph representation of a model, um, and that correlates negatively with understandability. Now we took for our multi-level uh, models we took the average over all. Um, levels, all the different models within the multi-level um, model, and we, we averaged the, the, the simplicity measures. We do recognize that this has its limitations, and yeah, unfortunately, we did not find any good simplicity measures that can fairly compare a flat model to a hierarchical model, um, so that we, we believe that for future work. However, given um, given this this uh, uh, this setting, um, we found that um, the multi-level minor scores better on understandability and uh, comparable on fitness and precision to existing techniques. Um, also because we are using existing techniques in the background, just in a more structured way. Um, for more details, I gladly uh, refer you to our paper. Um, now, finally, I'm gonna show you an, uh, an example um, so if we apply this to the BPI challenge log of 2018, then um, declare gives us this model, split miner gives us this model, and inductive miner gives us this model. Um, no, it's not a flower model. And um, the multi-level miner gives us this model. So using a little bit of extra information from the event log, we can structure the model um, in a in a way in a better way, and we argue that this model is easier to consider than the other ones. But yeah, again, um, the simplicity measures still need to catch up. Um, yes, you can try this. It is implemented in Prom. It works with any number of levels, and you can just choose your classifier and your technique and uh, give it a try. Um, and that wraps up my uh, presentation for today. I've uh, introduced the concept of multi-level languages shown you how multi-level models are being uh, done. And for a formal definition, of course, please refer to our paper. Um, I've shown you a technique to um, mine, to discover these multi-level models, and a technique to um, uh, check their conformance with, uh, with respect to their uh, event logs. In the future, in future work, we would like to work on simplicity measures, as I mentioned, um, for declare supporting conformance checking, um, we would like to recommend multi-level classifiers to users such that the technique uh, becomes even easier to use and, um, of course, extend it with what makes process mining so applicable in practice, namely performance measures and animation. Um, this wraps up my talk. Thank you. And I'm gladly give uh, the floor back to Arik. Thank you, Xander. Great presentation.
And we're happy that no babies were woken up. And hopefully that's the case for the live session as well. Um, I, I so truly we have, hope true. <laughs> we have two questions. Let's start with uh, Alessio. Alessio, uh, you can now unmute yourself and ask your question. Sorry, may I accidentally press the hand? Sorry. All right. Um, Will then? Will van der Alst, uh, I unmuted you. Yes, yeah, so, so thanks uh, a lot, Sander. Uh, very clear and good presentation as usual. Uh, so perhaps to ask my question, you can show, I think it was slide nine where you had this uh, like small example. It is now slide nine on my screen. It's 16 with us. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's laggy. I'll try turning off my video. I like if I all, all already asked the question, but, but I think it's only, only clear if, oh yeah, great. So we, we can now see it. So here you, you put the two A, X, Y and A, Y, you put them, uh, let's say separately as one event. And then in the sub process, I have X followed by Y. But if the B, X would be in between the A, X and the A, Y, and the A process would be concurrent to the B process, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, like you would split it into two, uh, like the sub process would become, uh, it would become a choice, right? So if I look um, at the trace no. A, X, B, X, A, Y, there mm -hmm. are basically two solutions. There is the solution that you have a sub process with the choice that you execute twice, or you put it concurrently and you have a sequence. And alignments are not going to resolve this problem for you, right? Um, yes, um, alignments will, will for this, like in the, in the bottom half of the, of the screen. So after we found the model, if the model tells us that A and B are concurrent, then the alignments will, um, uh, will uh, will take that into account so they will uh, the, the, the alignments will say ax and ay are actually both part of the same execution of a and then keep it together um, but, that is but, because we replace a by a loop a so a can be repeated uh, as many times as is necessary but the issue you're describing is there however it is in the first step no, no, um, that, 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 that's clear because in your explanation, you decided to club these two A's together because there was no other, uh, there was no other sub process somehow active between these two, right? Yeah, but that that's seems correct. an arbitrary choice if the A process could also be concurrent to the B process. That's correct. So, so the issue you describe is, is present in the first step um, and um, and unfortunately, um, it's, it's a bit of a chicken and egg problem. Um, if, uh, if we know that A is concurrent to B, then we could find it. However, if we know it, then we already kind of know the process model because we have knowledge about what is concurrent. So in, in the first step, there is unfortunately, um, at least in this structure that I'm proposing, there's, there's not much you can do about that. However, if the discovery technique is robust enough to filter that out and still discover the concurrency, then the, uh, then the splitting will be, uh, will be uh, as, as required. So then it will continue as, as necessary. But yes, in, in the first step, we definitely have a problem with concurrency um, because there's, there's no way that without any further information, we, we, can, um, we know what, uh, what A uh, which which A's belong together, and ironically, that one of the solutions to to that, or the, at least to address it partially, would be to use extra data from the levels below. So yeah, um, yeah, that, 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 that's what I was thinking. Perhaps there are characteristic start and end activities, and then you go the other direction. Yeah, yeah, but again, you have a chicken and egg problem because in order to, to know, know that, that you need to yeah. yeah so that's yeah. 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 Okay, thank you.
Thank you. And uh, thank you, Zander, again for the great talk. Um, if you can now, we don't have any more questions nor time for questions. If you can now unshare your screen and um, CC, you can share your screen once it's available. So our next uh, speaker is CC Lu. Um, and we would like to congratulate you again on the on winning the best um, process mining dissertation. And uh, this talk is a joint work with Victor Gal and Hayo Reyes on discovering hierarchical processes using flexible activity trees for event abstraction. Um, CC, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Eric. Uh, very glad to be here. Um, uh, as I said, my name is Cici Lu. Uh, I'm from the Utrecht University. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to present this work about discovering hierarchical processes using flexible activity trees for event abstraction. Um, this is joint work with Avigo from the Techno Israel Institute of uh, Technology um, and higher layers also from the Utrecht University. Um, this is the content of today, so it's a standard. We are going to uh, discuss research context, existing work, research problem, approach, evaluation, and conclusion. And I would like to thank you, Sander and Will, for this very nice introduction to the problem. <laughs> so uh, thank you. Uh, now I will dive into this um, complex processes we encounter in the reality. So last year we present this case study where we found this uh, spaghetti monster um, in a one for, uh, hospitals we collaborate with. So for this one year, we had about uh, 130,000 different patients, uh, 90,000 different uh, traces, 4 million events. But what's most important is there's 4,000 different activities. So 4,000 distinct activities. Um, so we discover a huge model. And even if we uh, were able to find a patient cluster or patient group, uh, for example, diabetes, so we still have 1,400 different activities. Uh, so how do we do that? How do we handle or how do we discover a model to represent such a huge process? Now, as Sander introduced, yes, uh, sometimes we have hierarchical information in our event log. So this is one of the event log um, uh, of the hospital, an example of the event log of the hospital. So we have uh, different activities correlated with the patient. And here, uh, so this visit is the low level event and um, it could be, uh, there's information about uh, one level higher. So it's might belong to contact subprocess. Also register is uh, assigned to contact subprocess. And you can see they might be interleaving. So here, for example, the contact subprocess might interleave with the lab that's subprocess. Now we also have found this information in other publicly available log. So for example, in 2017, uh, sorry, 2012 and 2017, we have an event log that's a merger of three intervened uh, interwined subprocesses where the first ledger indicate the subprocess. So this is one of the example also uh, Sandra mentioned. So here we have a subprocess start, uh, uh, workflow subprocess started, and then it's interleaving with a subprocess. Also in 2000, uh, BPI Challenge 2015, we have different, uh, uh, also this hierarchical information. So the first two digits indicates uh, the subprocesses. So here you see this, is, this indicates the main subprocess started, and this is interleaving with other subprocesses. So um, if we apply discovery algorithm on the BPI Challenge 12 law, uh, we get this uh, large model, um, but uh, how can we actually use the information, hierarchical information to discover more structured or precise models? So there has been existing work on uh, hierarchical process discovery and event abstractions. Um, so one of the very known is the state chart miner, which gives very nice visualizations. Uh, however, it cannot handle interleaved processes in the uh, on the other hand, you have the log pattern, uh, sorry, local process models uh, by Nick Dex and uh, alignment based uh, event abstraction by Felix Manhart. Um, so, uh, there, uh, however, the uh, alignment based approach is rather complex, uh, sorry, uh, computational complex. So, um, 
uh, this is an example of the state charm minor. We see indeed this uh, when we apply the state charm minor on the high level, you see this overly segmented um, behavior that state that a subprocess start and completed. And then uh, after that, uh, for example, workflow started, but uh, after that, a, a subprocess can start again. Whereas we might want to have uh, discovered this concurrent behavior where uh, a subprocess application subprocess started and concurrently uh, the workflow uh, subprocess started. After that, the offer subprocess started and uh, these two uh, ended uh, concurrently too. And after that, they all subprocess ended. So I'm revealing the solution a little bit. Um, of course, there are many existing work on this and which brings us also uh, to the challenges we have, uh, like what we discussed. So um, here uh, is the uh, research problem where we have the event lock uh, and we want to discover a hierarchical model or a multi-level process model. Um, the first one, as we discussed, is we will like to handle interleaving sub-processes. Um, secondly, uh, if there's this hierarchical information in the log, we will like to leverage this hierarchical information but if there's no such hierarchical uh, information in the log, we will also like to uh, support a automatically um, way to discover such a hierarchical information and use, use it for discovering hierarchical models. Um, thirdly, uh, we would like to be, it be less computational complex. Um, so sorry, no alignment. So how do we do that? Um, we did this in three steps. We propose a uh, concept or, or formalize an actual existing concept. We call this activity tree, basically. It's a hierarchical relation between activities. Uh, we first compute the tree, and then we use this tree to project and abstract the logs. And after that, uh, it, for each sub-log, we apply existing discovery algorithm to discover sub-model. Uh, so first, um, here we uh, zoom into how we compute the tree, and then we uh, explain how we discover uh, the logs. So what is an activity tree? An activity tree is simply a hierarchical clustering of activities. Uh, so there should be no overlapping between the nodes, and there should be, um, it should cover all the activities and the tree should be connected. So to give an example, uh, let's say we have here three traces, again, going through this uh, hospital example. Uh, so um, uh, let's say we have actually domain knowledge, like just uh, how it was recorded in the log. We have level one, level two. And so level one says it's the visit, the consultation and the registration belongs to subprocess C and so on and so forth. So we can use this domain knowledge to create this subprocess. Now, uh, we could also propose a uh, flat tree, which is then all the activities belong simply to the root. And finally, a fully random, uh, sorry, fully automated approach could be some, uh, a, a random clustering, which simply randomly uh, clustered activities um, uh, into such a hierarchical uh, tree, um, which results in activity tree. So uh, once we have this activity tree here, and we have one trace here, how do we proceed uh, with projection and abstraction? We simply go from the, from the height one, so bottom up non, uh, nodes, and going up to the tree and iteratively abstracts the logs. So here we start with activity A. The projection is very simple. We simply project uh, all the events that belongs to this subprocess and create this subtrace. Now we abstract uh, uh, sub process A by uh, keeping the first event and relabel that to uh, A start. So this E event, it belongs to sub process A and we abstract this, but we keep all other events that belongs to other sub processes. So here H is uh, uh, retained and we remove all internal behavior. So F is removed because this belongs to the, to the low level uh, model and L is retained, L, J is retained because they belong to other subprocess. And we retain the last event of the subprocess. So uh, G events that belongs to this subprocess, the last event we rename this A completed, so A ended. And also retain the rest of the, of the other behaviors. 
And then we continue with this with uh, another subprocess. So again, we project the uh, log on the B subprocess. We abstract the B by keeping the first event and the last event, relabel that to start and end, and then remove the internal behavior. And we continue this until the whole, tra whole tree is uh, finished. So we have now uh, these three logs uh, corresponding to a series of processes. And here we have the abstracted log. Uh, so for each of this, uh, let's say we have notable of those traces and then we have, this will create us a sub log that belongs to some process A. And then we can, uh, for each of the sub log we can use to discover a sub model for each of the sub process. Uh, for the abstracted log, we can then discover a higher level uh, process model uh, that shows the concurrence of the behavior. So uh, this is our uh, multi-level process model we discover at the end. Uh, that was our approach. Uh, we apply this approach on seven uh, publicly available logs, which is also used in the discovery benchmark. Um, for each of these logs, we uh, apply these three different uh, ways to compute activity tree. So the domain-based, the, the um, uh, flag tree, and the random tree. And we also report uh, existing uh, quality measures uh, in, the, in the benchmark paper. For each of this uh, tree, we then compute uh, using the inductive minor and a split minor to discover the submodels and the high-level models. Uh, and then for each model, we compute the fitness, generalization, simplicity, and uh, precision. So uh, again, to give an example of the results, so this is the BPI-12 uh, log. If we discover a flat tree, this is how it shows, uh, as we discussed. Now you could use the domain knowledge, uh, like we also discussed. So here we will see A start, A complete. Uh, concurrently or after A started, uh, the workflow subprocess started and ended somewhere here, and then the O started and ended somewhere here. And if we uh, discover the subprocess model that correspond with subprocess applications, so subprocess A, you'll see down very simple, structured, uh, precise model uh, return. So here you simply have submission accepted and in the final stage, uh, either approved, declined, or canceled. So, uh, but when you discover a subprocess model of the workflow uh, subprocess, so W, you see then it's uh, more concurrent, um, uh, a bit more um, uh, uh, choices or um, a parallel between activities. And uh, for the offer subprocess, again, it's very structured. So to give you another example, the BPI challenge 15, if you discover the flat model here, uh, it's huge, uh, but you could also use the domain knowledge uh, where you discover the, sub, uh, the, the root model, so the high level plus model here. And then uh, this shows that you have the uh, main sub process started and completed. And in parallel, all the small sub process were excluded. If you zoom into the uh, main process, you see a very sequential process model. Uh, here, it consists of multiple subprocesses again. So the first subprocess start with uh, zero here, also very sequential. Uh, subprocess one, main uh, subprocess one, it's a more parallel behavior. And then finally, also another very uh, simple subprocess main behavior too. So, uh, we uh, computed the fitness, precision, generalization, uh, and complexity. As we said, we, uh, there's a lot of results. Please have a look into the paper if you are interested. Uh, the, the general conclusion is that using the domain knowledge, we can improve uh, very well, relatively well in all four quality dimensions. Uh, so to give an example here, if you plot it, uh, so the blue one is the domain-based approach. And the, the, the lines are the uh, flat approach. So you see significant improvement in F1 score here. Also a significant decrease in complexity. Uh, surprisingly, actually the random uh, approach uh, also performed uh, pretty well when compared to the flat model. So this uh, was very interesting to see. Um, it, I think this is due to that there's way to localize the concurrent behavior into the subprocess models, uh, which allows to uh, discover more uh, precise structure models in other subprocess models. 
Um, so uh, this brings me to my conclusion and to work. Um, we have shown that we have now flexibility in handling very large sub-processes. Um, this is, of course, a little bit controversial way of using the quality measures. Um, there's huge discussion on that. If you're interested, please talk to uh, people who work in conformance checking. Um, we propose a random clustering for uh, discovering the activity tree uh, as an automated approach. Um, of course, this could be uh, improved by using either clustering, pattern mining, or other techniques. Um, for now, we have uh, one activity can only belong to one sub process. Uh, we would like to, we can extend that by, for example, attach conditions um, to that data aware, uh, context aware conditions. And um, uh, yes, uh, we now assume it's interleaving and in single instance. Uh, uh, it's always interleaving, let, let me put that way. Uh, you could uh, handle that by either pre or post process the sub blocks to discover melting senses or uh, segment in the traces and many more. Uh, so um, please, uh, if you are interested, have a look. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the talk. Thank you, Cici, for the great presentation. Um, we will now take questions, and we have a question by Zander. Um, go ahead, Zander. Uh, th thanks, Arik. Um, I have a question. How did you measure um, uh, simplicity? Ah, we um, computed the, the number of nodes and the uh, uh, CFC, but we also computed many others. Uh, but due to the space limitation in the paper, we couldn't report all the complexity measures. So did you did you pretend did you like flatten the model and then uh, then use that, or did you? How did you combine the different levels of the? So we didn't combine the levels indeed. And that's why I also said this is a little bit controversial way of using thinness. So we, what we did was we simply, um, uh, let me, whether I can go there. Uh, so for example, here uh, we have uh, one, two, three, four, five models and assume more. So for each model, we compute the thinness, precision uh, and other measures. And then we compute the average for the for the whole collection of the models. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, next question is by Will. Will, go ahead. Um, you can unmute yourself. Yeah. Thank. Uh, thanks. Uh, 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 it's a good talk. Uh, CZ very much related to the previous talk. Uh, I didn't look at the paper, but. Uh, did you look at the paper uh, process discovery using localized events, which is also kind of partitioning the event set? But, but I can talk, to talk about that offline. The, the, the real question that I want to ask is that you have this activity tree yes. that is clear, eh? and you presented multiple ways of getting that. But then in your example, uh, you somehow when you are going through the trace, you are deciding what is the first one, that's easy, but then also what is the last one? Um, so, so I think slide 11, yeah, for, for, for example here. Uh, so if I would now have EFG, EFG twice, mm -hmm. how would you know where to cut it? That, uh, that's indeed the, the, the assumption now that we assume uh, if there's another EFG continuing here, it's all belong to subprocess A. So that would be a single instances uh, projected. Uh, so that's the upset of what Sander proposed. So I think we can learn from each other. Uh, but then, uh, for example, we could use indeed uh, other data attributes uh, if there's an uh, instance. Um, uh, case identifier, or if uh, there's a, uh, basically other ways to cut after the projection is done. But that means that if you look at the bottom of this slide, that the end is always like this, right? Because all the processes remain active until the very end. So it, in other words, the process never stops. Um, we have seen some, uh, for example, uh, subprocess ending uh, and then after that, it's merged into higher level processes. So I think that was also, um, uh, let me put that way. Uh, in, 
this. Uh, you could see that, uh, yeah. for example, a uh, subprocess ended much earlier than the main subprocess ended, uh, and then it's merged into main subprocess. So it actually shows very rich behavior between concurrent uh, uh, subprocesses, which uh, I think I now might be able to use for queuing yeah. uh, or performance but analysis. It, but then it is re related to the paper that I was just uh, talking about. So you know the, de the decomposed process discovery type of stuff uh, yes. uh, and there there's also the assumption that uh, that the sub process remains active forever so, 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 so that's I think a bit similar yeah. yeah thank you thank you thank you again for the presentation CC um, we don't have time for any other for, for more questions if you can unshare your screen and uh, Volodymyr will share his Um, ah, stop sharing. Thank you. Our next speaker is Volodymyr Leno. Um, he will talk uh, with us about identifying candidate routines for RPA from unsegmented UI logs. Um, Volodymyr, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Volodymyr Leno. And today I'm going to present to you our approach for identification of uh, candidate routines for automation from unsemented UI log. So let's start from the introduction. Robotic process automation is a technology that allows business organizations to automate highly repetitive clerical tasks within their processes by uh, developing and executing software scripts, also known as RPA bots. A uh, traditional way of identification of the candidates to be automated is by conducting the interviews, workshops, or by uh, simply observing the worker performing his tasks at place. Such, such traditional methods however, require a lot of time, and also the information about the routine can be incomplete. An alternative way of collecting the information about routine is to record uh, the execution of the tasks in the form of the uh, user interaction logs. A typical user interaction log is a chronologically ordered sequence of user interactions with information systems, for example, a web browser or, or, or Excel spreadsheet uh, to, to, uh, during, their, during the execution of their tasks. Given such log, it is impossible to automatically identify the candidate's routine, for example, by applying traditional sequence mining algorithms. However, in practice, the UI logs are usually unsegmented. A UI log uh, may, may capture a long running sequence of in user interactions, uh, and the user could perform multiple instances of a task during this during this session, however, uh, while recording, it is not possible to automatically identify the boundaries between these instances. Therefore, we propose the following approach. It, it consists of three main steps: representing and normalization, segmentation, and routine identification. I will go through each step in details in the next slides. So, given the Given the recorded UI log, it first has to be pre-processed, which is basically means that we have to remove all the redundant activities that were recorded. For example, a navigation across different cells in a, in a spreadsheet without copying their content, or a copying without the corresponding paste. After the log was pre-processed, the vast majority of user interactions are unique because they contain different values of their attributes in the payload. Accordingly, the next step, uh, in, in order to explain the next step, I need to introduce the notion of, of data parameters and context parameters. All UI parameters can be divided into data parameters that contain the, the data values used during the execution of a task 
and context parameters. They capture the information about the location where the action took place. For example, uh, an application and, and an element within this application. The data parameters are usually unique for all uh, for all actions across the across the different traces. Well, context parameters you you be most likely the same the same action within the task. Correspondingly, we had to remove all the all the data parameters, and the step is called normalization. After the lock was normalized, the next step is to construct the control flow graph. Uh, every node in such graph corresponds to the normalized user interaction. For example, click button new record or edit field date. While every edge between these nodes is a directly follows relation between the corresponding UIs. This log also has a, an explicit starting point, which is uh, connected with the, with the first UI in the log. The log usually will contain the loops, which represent uh, the frequent behavior that was executed several times. We assume that this behavior corresponds to the, to, the, to the actual task under recording, and, and, all the, uh, and all the nodes of this loop correspond to the actions performed during this task. Accordingly, if we will find the start and end of the loop, we will find potential start and end of the task. How do we do this? First, we construct the, the dominator tree from the given log, and and uh, every like every parent in this in this dominator tree will dominate all its uh, all its children. For example, a click button new record dominates click button submit because every time. When you want to reach click button submit starting from the starting from the entry point, you have to pass through click via click button new record. We find the loops by mining by discovering the strongly connected components in the graph. Accordingly, then we find the the header of this strongly connected component which is the node that dominates all the other nodes within this strong connected component. And it's not dominated by, by any node within this component. Correspondingly, all the incoming edges to the header will be back edges. And we will use the information about the, it was the discovered back edges to segment the lock. In this example, we, we identify the back edges. We identify the back edge, click button submit to click button new record. After we, uh, after we discover the back edges, we remove them from the control flow graph and, uh, and identify the strong components uh, of, the, uh, of the deeper level. So in this way, we will find all the nested routines. Given the discovered back edges, we use them to segment the lock. Here you can see that we discovered two different segments that correspond to click button submit, click button new record, back edges. After we discovered uh, the segments, after we segmented the lock, the next step is to identify the candidate routines. And this can be done by, by mining frequent sequential patterns in the corresponding sequences. Given this example, the corresponding routines will be the following. However, as you can see, uh, the user interaction one uh, participate uh, uh, is, uh, is an element of all these patterns. However, on practice, 
one UI can only belong to one routine. In order to deal with this problem, we propose the following solution. We discover the frequent patterns as usual. Then we run them accordingly to, to a certain metric, for example, a length or frequency, and select the best pattern according to this metric. We remove all these occurrences from the segments and repeat the procedure until no more frequent patterns left. Given the same example presented earlier, and and uh, length as uh, as a as a selection metric, we will find the following kind of routines. The procedure will stop because we didn't find frequent patterns anymore. In our evaluation, we use the collection of uh, artificial and real life logs of different sizes and complexities. All the logs can be classified into three types. Synthetic logs that we used from the previous studies. The logs recorded in the, uh, in the supervised settings, where the, where the worker has been given the instruction of how to perform, on how to perform the task. We recorded the student records and the reimbursement log, and then, uh, and then merge them to, to test how our technique will perform in the case where the log contains different routines. Finally, the last type of the logs that we used is the logs recorded in unsupervised settings. These, these two logs uh, were recorded by the University of Melbourne employees, and they, and they were not given the instructions on, on how to perform their tasks, and instead were left on, on uh, performing their job as being unrecorded. First we, evaluate, first, we evaluated the quality of the segments discovered. As you can see, for the artificial logs, we discovered um, original segments, while for the real-life logs recorded in supervised settings, the quality of segments was, was slightly, slightly worse. And and all the segments were discovered in a reasonable amount of time. Then we evaluated the rediscovery in order to assess the quality of the routines that were discovered. We used four, uh, four metrics to evaluate the results. The length of the discovered routines, the total coverage that uh, marks the, the percentage of the logs that was covered by the discovered routines. The Jacquard coefficient to show the similarity between the discovered routines and the ground truth, and the execution time to show the effectiveness, to show the computational efficiency of our approach. We used four, four different selection metrics, such as frequency, length, coverage, and cohesion. As you can see, uh, the best results were obtained by applying the length and cohesion selection metric, with, with, cohesion, with cohesion showing slightly better results. However, the cohesion was the slowest one among all four. A few words about the real-life logs. Uh, they, were, they, were, they were recorded uh, in the settings of the of the, of the University of Melbourne and capturing the scholarship allocation process. Uh, they, were, they were performed, the tasks were, were performed by different workers, uh, capturing 93 minutes of work during uh, when uh, 53 cases were handled. These logs capture more than 1,000 actions. To show the results about the real life logs, we discovered the 35 segments for the first scholarship log and, uh, and two different routines. We discovered this, this uh, we discovered five different variants of such routines in 45 seconds, which is a reasonable amount of time. For the, for the scholarship two log, we didn't discover the, 
the actual routines because uh, the second log describes more complex and unstructured behavior. For example, the user was uh, constantly switching between different tables, like between different spreadsheets, and performing several tasks at a time, multiple tasks at a time. To sum up briefly, let's talk about the limitations and the future work. Uh, our approach relies on data quality of the lock in order to identify the candidate routines and to, uh, uh, and, to, and to obtain the correct segments. It also requires the expert knowledge to identify context parameters. When the, when the routine was performed in different in different way, for example, uh, uh, actions are in different order, we will discover several variants of the same routine. And of course, they will be redundant. Finally, we have also some restrictions to the, to the routines and the recording. For example, they should not overlap in the log, and all, and all routine executions should start from the same action. Accordingly, as a future work, we plan to, to, to implement the technique to automatically identify context parameters, to improve the approach to ease the requirements to record the routines, and add post-processing to remove redundant variants of the routine. Thanks. Thank you for attending. I will be happy to answer all your questions if you have some. Thank you, Volodymyr, for the interesting presentation. Um, I see that we don't have questions in the Q&A or um, nor hands raised. Um, we have time for a couple of quick questions. Maybe I'll start. Um, you were talking about the separation between context and things that are unique to a trace. Uh, could you please yes. clarify how exactly you're using that information in the approach? That the context information? Uh, yes, indeed. So, so uh, like, uh, first of all, I have to say that uh, usually all the values uh, of, of user interactions will be different. Like, because, well, uh, you work with different values in the spreadsheet, like for, for each case. But, uh, but like, if you usually work with the same, like, uh, even different task executions, you usually work with the same spreadsheet uh, in the same form, like the context parameters will be the same. Like they will be identical for all the task instances. An example of such context parameters, uh, like, uh, like a name of a field or a button uh, or, a, like, or a label of a button. And for, uh, like, let's, like let's work with example. Uh, in this UI log, the context parameter will be application because, like, it's like it's always the same, and the element label because uh, because you will work like because you will always click the new record button in every instance. While, for example, when editing a field, you will assign different values. For example, you still edit field full name, but with different values for for different routine instances. So that's how. So that's why if you like if you will keep only context parameters, you will like you will group, you will detect the the UIs that even having different values in the payload still still correspond to the same action within a task. And that's how you can understand the the, the repetition. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I hope I answered. Thank you, Claire. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Um, we have no further questions from the attendees. Um, and so I think that we can conclude this wonderful process discovery section, uh, session. Um, I thank the speakers again, Zander, Sisi, Volodymyr, and I hope you uh, all enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Wait, we have a question. Um, yes. Mar Marlon, before I conclude, specifying the so-called context parameters is akin to specifying which column is the activity mapping when you import a CSV file. So it's more of a comment than a question. Thank you, Marlon, for the clarification. And I now formally conclude the session. Um, thanks, everyone, for speaking and attending.